sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace. The God of hope. The God of restoration. Good morning, everybody. As we enter into worship this morning, we invite you to stand with us if you're able as we come before Lord and worship. There's got to be more than going back and forth from doing right to doing wrong because we were taught that's who we are. Come on, get in line right behind me. You along with everybody Thinking there's worth in what you do Then like a hero who takes the stage When we're on the edge of our seats Saying it's too late Let me introduce you to amazing grace No matter the bumps no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made. The cross has made you flawless. Could it possibly be? We simply can't believe that this unconditional kind of love would be enough to take a filthy wretch like this and wrap him up in righteousness. That's exactly what he did. No matter the bumps. No matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made. The cross has made you flawless. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Take a breath, smile, and say right here, right now, I'm okay because the cross was then like a hero then like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats and it's too late let me introduce you to grace grace god's grace no matter the bumps no matter the bruises no matter the scars Still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how 
how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. smile and say right here right now I'm okay because the cross was
song that we're going to sing is called Indescribable. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I remember singing this in junior high and high school youth group. Um, but the thing that's really neat about this song is it talks about how God sees even the depths of our heart, but he still loves us the same. He sees everything that's yucky and nitty and gritty, but it doesn't matter. That doesn't change how much he loves for us, and I think that's pretty cool. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Who's told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Indescribable. Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by. Name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. One more time, indescribable. Indescribable. Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing.
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgive was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is believe it sing it with us what a savior oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing alleluia christ is risen bow down before him for he blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. You can be seated this morning. teamwork. <laughs> well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. And uh, for those that are worshiping online, we have an introduction for you as well as we've gathered together on this day. 
Dr. Larry McCain, our district superintendent for the Chicago Central District Church of the Nazarene, is with us today. And uh, he's going to come at this time and have the privilege of doing something that happens in the church that is kind of exciting, I believe, uh, especially during this season. I don't know other churches that may be doing this, but we have four individuals who are going to come into membership today. And so we thought this would be a good time to have Dr. McCain greet them. So we're going to ask them to come. Um, Leighton and Maria, if you would stand here, and then Gabe and Adam here, then people can see our district superintendent's smiley face. But if you would come and stand, we're going to gather for joining of membership this morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you can grab the mic too, that'd be good. Yeah, I need to, I need to use this. So, um, so, so good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and for everybody who is joining online, uh, we want to bring you greetings from the Chicago Central District. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for that warm introduction and for the privilege of being in this church today. Uh, I also want you to know that uh, uh, as we worship here today, uh, for you who may not understand or know about the Chicago Central District, uh, this is a district that has 81 churches. So there are churches all over the district today that are, that are welcoming people. And so it's great to, to have all of you here. Uh, technically this morning, uh, because of the authority that's vested in me, uh, I will be meeting with the church uh, congregation, members and attenders, as soon as this service is over, to go into a private uh, dialogue with just the, the uh, um, uh, superintendent and all of you, but I want to announce to you based on, the, on my authority uh, uh, given to me by the district assembly of the Chicago Central District, uh, this morning I am, cho I, am, I am choosing to use that authority and I am going to appoint Adam Wood as the interim pastor of this church for the coming Amen. six months. Amen. So would you give him a hand? And so, Pastor, uh, I'm going to give you the authority. You'll be joining along with them, but you also have the ones as the pastor that have signed this. So would you be <laughs> so kind as to introduce the three people that are, that are joining with you today? Thank you, Dr. McCain. And thank you, everybody. I love you all. Uh, this morning, I have three individuals that I've gotten to know pretty well over the last <laughs> year or so. Um, yes, exactly. And they're actually, they all are or have served on the worship team um, in different capacities. Uh, it started out with just Matt and I, and then uh, Gabe, I found out about his talents and he was very, very humble, but once we got him up here, he was quite the drummer <laughs> and uh, I'm just glad he's not signed and out on the road somewhere and he's here with us. <laughs> and uh, we have Leighton, Luke Sander, did I pronounce it right? Luke Sander, Luck Sander, Luck Sander, Leighton Luck Sander and his wife Maria and their little guy Leo. Uh, they have uh, <laughs> been on the worship team for quite some time. Leighton is a fantastic vocalist and he's been playing bass for us. Maria's played piano, she's on a little hiatus, but. Uh, really great and and uh, leo sings and plays the shaker a lot too and he's pretty pretty fantastic so uh <laughs> it uh it is an honor um and a privilege to uh bring them in as members uh, of pax naz and the church of the nazareth thank you thank you pastor the privilege and the blessings that we have in community together in the church are sacred and precious there is a wonderful fellowship of care and uh, counsel that can't be found in any other place but the church. There's the godly care of a pastor. There is the teaching of the word of God, the inspiration of our worship together, and the cooperation in service, in service coming together to do together what nobody can do themselves. Today we affirm again the doctrines of the church. They are brief and they are these. We believe in one God, 
God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, that they need the work of forgiveness through Jesus and the new birth of the Holy Spirit, and that following that there is the deeper work of heart cleansing or entire sanctification through the filling with the Holy Spirit, and that to this the Holy Spirit gives us witness. We believe that Jesus will return and that the dead will be raised and that all will come to final judgment with its both rewards and punishment. Today, we affirm these truths. Do you hardly believe them? And if so, answer, I do. Okay. Do you acknowledge that Jesus is your personal Savior and do you believe that he saves you now? If so, answer, I do. Amen. Desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord with all of your heart? Commit yourself to the mission of Jesus, the doctrine and the fellowship and the work of the church. Will you support the teachings of the church? Follow the instruction and encouragement of your pastor. And will you endeavor in every way to glorify God with a humble walk, with speaking wisely, holy serving, and by giving of your resources faithfully participating in the means of grace and will you seek to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord following Jesus? If so, answer, I will. I will. I want to welcome you to the Church of the Nazarene and to Pax Naz. This is a fabulous church, as you already know. And uh, there are some certificates of membership. I'm going to have the pastor uh, pass out. And I just want you all to know that you, are, you have just witnessed Four more people coming into the Church of the Nazarene. We have 30,700 congregations like this all over the world. Last week, we started 27 new churches like this. Last week, we had 2,872 new people join the church just like this. And we've been doing that every week for the last 10 years in a row. And this church has a fabulous future with these new members. So can you welcome them? Let's all stand and uh, give them a, a warm welcome uh, for being new members of the church. So it's good to have you here. Uh, we can't take you in, but we can put an elbow on. God bless you. you. You can be seated. Thank you, Dr. McCain. Well, Renee and I have mixed feelings today. It's exciting to see the future and what's going to be happening with Pax Naz as we watch from afar. But uh, we do appreciate the fact that you have welcomed us in to serve with you for the last six months. It's hard to believe it's been that long. And a lot of that we actually have been here. That's been kind of neat. Uh, the first Sunday that I was supposed to take the role of interim pastor was the first Sunday that COVID hit the world in the United States and everything was canceled. And so uh, it was a very quick week to figure out, uh, with the help of Adam, we were online and basically doing uh, church within a couple of days uh, from, not, from this location. But I'll never forget our time and be praying for you for the future. And I want to thank Dr. McCain for his opportunity to let me lead this congregation for the last few months. And, uh, and I want to thank Adam, who has become a good friend and helped us thrive through this time because we wouldn't have been online. We wouldn't have had online giving. We, would, we wouldn't have, the list is a mile long. And so I would say, can we do this? He'd say, let me check on it. And then he would check on it. And next thing you know, it was working. And so we do appreciate that. And we will have a long life of connecting uh, together and talking about ministry. So with that, um, I'm thankful for his heart for God and for your opportunity to let us come and what God is doing in your lives. And uh, so I want to kind of just re rethink a little bit of the journey before we get to the story of Joshua today. The idea that we did Easter from an online perspective, which was tough to not be in God's house on Easter. But uh, the preaching series is where you've been patient with me as I've repeated things over and over. I think it's the rote learning part of what I do in youth ministry that you just kind of just kind of keep focusing on that. We've had series like When Jesus Shows Up and Freedom and Follow Me and then My Story. 
And I think as thinking about these things, one of the things that I know we've explored and talked about is the idea of a disciple and that Jesus had disciples, but we are disciples. There were disciples before Jesus. There were individuals in the Old Testament who learned to follow the ways of God through the leading of a teacher. And so as we think of disciple, we often think about that New Testament, but I want us to think about Joshua today. The individual who stepped alongside Moses and was a part of his life. And the lessons that we can learn from Joshua, from the lessons he learned through Moses and that God led him in. In Exodus chapter 17, we see for the very first time when Joshua comes on the scene, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites. A lot of ites going on in that part of the uh, Old Testament. And so Moses says to Joshua, you're in charge of the army. Get out there and defeat them. So Moses goes out and defeats the enemy. So Moses told Joshua that while this is happening, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to go to the top of a mountain, and I'm going to stand, and I'm going to hold my hands up. And when I hold my hands up, it means that God is with us, and God will continue to bless us, and the battle will be won. So in that process, he went up, and when Moses began to get tired and his arms began to drop, the enemy began to take momentum, and the Israelites began losing the battle. And so he had Aaron and Hur hold his arms up, and through that, the battle was won. We see a great life lesson here. When we are lifting our hands in praise, with God's help, we're winning. Even when we look around the battle, we're like, okay, I don't know if we're getting any further in this thing. As long as we're doing this, we're seeing the battle is going to be won. So, as we think about that, and we see the fact that in these experiences, Joshua has watched Moses, and he has seen his frustrations, and he has seen his rewards in serving and following God. He was there at a distance to see on Mount Sinai when God met with Moses. He also saw Moses get frustrated and throw the Ten Commandments down and break them when he saw that the people were sinning. Through all of this, it makes up this discipleship that Joshua had under Moses so that now he could become the leader. So our series continues, My Story, and you probably remember many times I've said, you have a story, I have a story, we all have a story, and stories are important to the history of what God is doing in our lives and in our world. So now we're going to look at Joshua's story. Now, Throughout the book of Joshua, there's several places where there are texts and stories, and so I'm going to kind of com- condense some of these today so we can get some major thoughts that we can get across that uh, we'll have the time for. The first thing we're going to see, there are four things. There's a fulfillment of God's promise. The second thing we're going to look at is the crossing of the Jordan, the fall of Jericho, and then the conquering of the nations. So for those that like to check boxes, after these four boxes, I'll be done. All right, so we're going to go through those four boxes, though. So the first thing in Genesis chapter 12, in order to understand Joshua's story, you really got to kick back to the beginning of the story, and it was the call of Abram in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Here's what it says. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make you a great name, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. In order to understand Joshua's story, we have to look at the promises that God made to Abram. Because it's the continuation of the fulfillment of the promises that were made. So in order to understand that, we need to kind of walk through a little bit the idea that Abram, who was obedient to God's promises and was blessed, followed basically blindly. He followed what it was that God was calling him to do, even though he didn't understand what it meant. What a challenge for us today to understand. So when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, he had really no idea what God had in store. So God would be faithful to Abraham, and the promises that he made, he didn't understand, and he never saw fulfilled, but he had the promise. So God calls us to a daily walk with him in which he reveals our steps. 
God knew what he wanted to do. We often don't know what God wants to do. So God had opened the door for me at some point to go to Olivet to study one area and then discover that he had another plan for my life. God opens doors and he moves us in directions that was not something that was necessarily a part of our plan, but it is a fulfillment in his plan. God's fulfillment in our lives becomes a revelation for what he's calling us to do. Every one of us has a call to help fulfill what God's promise is in the world. Most of the time, we will not know what it is. And most of the time, we will not understand it. But once we've gone through it, and we look back over our shoulder, we see where God's presence has moved in our lives. Joshua's story is a continuation of the fulfillment of God's promise. So now we see the second thing that's happening in, in, in Joshua's life of significance, and that is the crossing of the River Jordan. So Moses led the Israelites out of slavery, kind of a big deal. We all know Moses, and he led them when God divided the Red Sea into the desert, where they spent the next 40 years waiting for God to fulfill what's going to happen in his people. So Moses was not going to lead the people into the promised land. The next generation would go. In Deuteronomy 30, 31, we see that Moses passes the leadership on to Joshua, who God has chosen to lead the people. Let's look at this text in Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Joshua chapter 3, 1 to 4. Crossing of the Jordan. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp. Because you remember, it wasn't like there were six people getting in a minivan, all right? They're moving lots of people. So it took them about three days to do this. So after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving the orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. How many times in our lives have we been in a situation where we have never been this way before? You would think in life we would experience times that it would become pretty easy, and I don't think God really wants that. I think he wants us at each stage to trust him. So God has chosen people throughout history to be his leaders. God has filled men and women with the desire to follow when he calls on them. Joshua had spent time with Moses, but even more importantly, Joshua had spent time with God. God was the one who was walking Joshua through these stages of life. So Joshua loved God, and he was a willing leader to serve. Not every leader is willing to do what the supervisor says, but Joshua was willing to do whatever God calls him to do. I'm so sure that he had no idea what he was going to do once he got across the river because God was walking him through it a step at a time. Sometimes we'd love to know what's out there, but he's going to show us right here. In times like this, we need to be reminded that God has led people in the past, and he will lead his people today to the future. The Israelites experienced times when the future seemed to have obstacles in the way, and so crossing the river into the land that God had promised his people presented a challenge for the future. What's going to happen? I think about when I was a kid and I would hear the stories about uh, Moses and the people coming out, the Israelites coming out of slavery, and then and how they're going to go to the land of milk and honey. I always thought, cross the one river, cross the next river, and then boom, you got milk and honey. <laughs> Not even close. It's not even close to what's happening in their lives, but that's what I perceived as a child. So in the crossing of the River Jordan, which has been separated now, he says to Joshua, 
choose 12 men, one from each tribe, and about half through, have them pick up a big rock. Okay? And carry that rock to the other side. Because once everyone has crossed, we're going to build an altar, and those 12 stones will represent the 12 tribes, each tribe knowing and having a story that they can tell to their children. This is where God brought us from, and these stones came from the middle of that river. Because it's important for the next generation to tell the new generation what God has done. Joshua chapter 4 tells us a story when they crossed that river. I want us to look at Joshua 5.1 for just a moment. As we continue in looking at his life. One simple verse. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings, Canaanite kings along the coast had heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Isn't that a great story to say, all right, we heard about this army. Their God separated the water and they walked through. I'm not so sure if we can take these guys on anymore because they had that confidence in watching somebody have something happen in their lives that they didn't expect to happen in their own. And so it, God began with this story to melt the hearts of those who might fear what might be taking place. So the fall of Jericho. I'm sorry, but when I think of the fall of Jericho, all I can picture is veggie tales from when my boys were young and the peas, the little green peas. Yeah, <laughs> the little green peas saying, well, what shall we do here? And they, and they basically are hilarious, but you really don't catch the message from the veggie tales as you do if you really look at the text. So the fall of Jericho takes place in Joshua chapter 6. And so here's the, here's the story. God says to Joshua, I've got some steps I want you to walk through. I've got some faith movements. You're going to have to trust me on this one. He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to line up your army, and I want you to go to Jericho and march around one time, then come back and sit for the next 23 hours. Then I want you to get up again the second day and march and go around the city one time. Three days, four days, five days, six days. And so now the plan for the last day is, is I want seven priests to be taking horns ahead of the covenant, ahead of the army, and you're going to go around seven times today. And on the seventh time, they're going to blow their horns. And when they've come around one full time and their horns have been blown, they're going to do a loud shout, and I want everyone to shout out loud, and the walls are going to come down and make them vulnerable for your army. So Joshua gets to go to his military leaders and say, here's the plan. We're going to go and we're going to march around. And they don't know this story. Seems absurd. We're going to march around and march around. And the last day we're going to do this. And this is going to happen. And they're going to start thinking, you're our leader? How in the world are these things going to happen? So I can't imagine what his military leaders felt, but I can tell you this, when God's chosen leaders follow, the people walking along will begin to catch the vision as well. So God's presence in this setting and God's promise way back at Abraham is what's going to deliver his people. So the fourth thing that we see is the conquering of nations. When God, described, when God decides to bless his people with a promise, he follows through all the way. This wouldn't be the first time that God came to their aid. It wouldn't be the last. Just for us, it, it's, he's come to our, our aid in our lives at some point. He continues to walk beside us, and he's going to continue in the future. But in this situation, the conquering of nations, if you want to read it this afternoon, there's a lot to it but I'm going to kind of condense it down. Chapter 12 of Joshua lists all the armies and the nations that they defeat. Battle of Jericho was one. There were 31 nations that Joshua and his army defeated. Now, to use a sports analogy, they were 31 and zero. All right? 
That's a pretty good record. And I think what happens here is kind of interesting. As they defeat Jericho, they're on a roll. Who's next? I don't know if they marched every time or what they did, but basically they defeated them. And then they defeated them. And so his people, as they're following Joshua, go, this plan didn't sound too good the first time. But since we're now 31 and 0, we're, we're starting to see that this is working. And it was in that that the promise to the people happened. The journey took them through all these different times, all these battles, all these situations to get them where God promised he'd take them all along. So some final reflections. There are times in our lives when we wonder what God's plan is for us. And we live there a lot of the time. Because he's always working, he's always doing and moving in our lives. Now, whether it's our family, our church, our nation, as we look around today, what we are facing in the world, God has always used his people in order to fulfill his promise to Abraham. God still uses his leaders today and uses us all individually to accomplish what he has set out to do. God has been using godly men and women at the Paxton Church of the Nazarene since 1943. And he's still using you. And he still has a plan. And he's, he's, we don't always know what it is, but he's got this plan. And if he asks Joshua just to circle the building, I'm not saying we're going to go out and do that today, but if he asks you to, would you do it? That's the key. So one of the things I think is really neat is in God's plan for this community, if we can remember what Moses did, and he had his hands high. And when the hands were high and when people were praising God, during those times, you'll be winning the battle. When we begin to drop our hands and forget who we're focusing on, it becomes a challenge. So I'd like to close this morning by sharing this blessing with you that comes from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you 